This is part two of myocardial infarctions. In this part, I'll discuss five special situations in the EKG diagnosis of an acute MI. New conduction system disease, hypothesizing the culprit lesion in an inferior MI, the diagnosis of a right ventricular MI, the diagnosis of a posterior MI, and the diagnosis of an acute MI in the setting of a left bundle branch block. I'll start with new conduction system disease and a review of the blood supply to the conduction system. Of course, we have the right coronary artery circumflex and LAD. The main components of the conduction system are the SA or sinus node, the AV node, the His bundle, and the right and left bundle branches. The blood supply to the conduction system is more variable, possibly more redundant, and generally not as well established as the blood supply to the myocardial walls. However, this is what is known. In about 55% of people, the RCA supplies the SA node, and it's supplied by the circumflex in about 45%. The RCA usually supplies the AV node, but it can be supplied by the circumflex in a minority of people. The left and right bundle branches are supplied by the LAD, and the bundle of His likely has a dual supply from the RCA and the LAD. So when dealing with new conduction system disease complicating an acute MI, the specific type of conduction problem can suggest a specific culprit vessel or possible vessels. Sinus node dysfunction, either sinus bradycardia or sinus arrest, suggests either a proximal RCA or proximal circumflex obstruction. The cause of first degree AV block or type one second degree AV block is typically located in the AV node but can be rarely located in the His bundle. Thus, acute obstruction of any vessel can theoretically lead to these rhythm problems. However, type two second degree AV block is almost always distal to the AV node and thus when it occurs in the setting of acute MI is almost always due to obstruction in either the LAD or RCA and usually not the circumflex. The etiology of third degree block can be located in either the AV node or His bundle. And finally, a new right or left bundle branch block is most suggestive of LAD disease. The next special situation is how to hypothesize the culprit vessel in an inferior infarction. That is, when a patient is experiencing an inferior STEMI, is there any way to predict whether the patient has a left or right dominant circulation? So whether the obstructive vessel is the RCA or circumflex, remembering that in about 80% of people, the posterior descending artery and thus the inferior wall is supplied by the RCA, in 15% it's supplied by the circumflex, and in about 5% it's supplied by both. I'll refresh your memory of the exact orientation of three key leads for this determination. In the event that there is concurrent ST elevation in lead one, the circumflex is highly likely to be the culprit as this would imply both an inferior and lateral MI and the RCA never supplies the lateral wall. In the event that there is concurrent ST depression in lead one, the RCA is highly likely to be the culprit. The tricky one to remember is if the ST segment in one is isoelectric, which is the most common scenario. In this case, it depends on how the ST elevation in two compares to that in three. From the figure in the lower right, you can see that three is angled more to the right. So it sort of makes sense that if the ST elevation in three is greater than two, the RCA is more likely to be the culprit vessel. Whereas if the ST elevation in two is greater than or equal to three, the obstruction is more likely in the circumflex. This algorithm or very similar variations on the same theme have been validated in more than one published study. Next to discuss is the diagnosis of a right ventricular infarct. RV infarcts are relatively uncommon because they require a proximal RCA occlusion. Also, the RV is less susceptible to ischemia and infarction due to a reduced workload and a thinner chamber wall as compared to the left ventricle. The thin chamber wall allows intracavitary blood to serve as a secondary source of oxygen. 
When an RV infarct does occur, it's suggested by hypotension and or acute conduction system problems accompanying an inferior infarct. The hypotension is suggestive because an isolated infarct of the inferior wall of the LV should not typically be hemodynamically significant enough to cause hypotension on its own. The conduction system problem is more of an association since the RCA's contribution to the conduction system usually takes off from the main vessel very proximally, which increases the probability an RCA obstruction is also proximal to the takeoff of the RV artery. Another suggestive feature of an RV infarct concurrent with an inferior infarct is the additional presence of ST elevation in lead V1, which exceeds any ST elevation that may or may not be present in V2. The presence of an RV infarct can be confirmed by using some unconventional EKG leads, which are called V3R, V4R, V5R, and V6R, the R standing for right. The location of these right-sided leads is the mirror image of their left-sided counterparts. For example, V4R is in the fifth intercostal space in the right midcollicular line, V6R is in the fifth intercostal space in the right mid-axillary line, V3R is halfway between V1 and V4R, and V5R is halfway between V4R and V6R. In practice, when trying to rule in or rule out an RV infarct, most clinicians only bother with V4R, which they create by simply taking the EKG wire normally reserved for V4 and placing it on the V4R electrode. This is what the EKG of an RV infarct looks like after doing that. You can see an obvious inferior STEMI. In addition, there is ST elevation present in V1 and V2, with the elevation in V1 being greater than that in V2. That already strongly suggests an RV infarct. To confirm it, the clinician has included lead V4R, which shows up on the EKG in the same place, usually reserved for V4. The presence of ST elevation in V4R confirms the RV infarct. As with RV infarcts, posterior infarcts can also coexist with inferior infarcts. However, they can be even trickier to diagnose, particularly in the acute phase. Since no conventional EKG leads look directly at the posterior wall, one must look for reciprocal changes for the diagnosis. These include the presence of horizontal ST depressions and prominent upright T waves in V1 and V2, which are the inverse of ST uh, elevations and T wave inversions, and thus occur generally in the acute and early subacute phases. And also an R to S ratio greater than 1 in either V1 or V2, which is the inverse of a Q wave as seen from behind, so to speak. Therefore, this is seen only after the MI is half a day to several days old. The presence of a posterior infarct can be confirmed by using the unconventional posterior EKG leads V7 through V9. Looking at the patient's back, V7 is placed in the posterior axillary line in the same horizontal plane as V6. V8 is placed at the tip of the scapula in the same horizontal plane as V6 and V9 is in the left paraspinal region, also in the same horizontal plane. When recording the EKG, it's most common for V7 through V9 to take the place of V4 through V6 on the actual paper printout. So for example, here's an EKG of a patient experiencing an inferior STEMI. You can also note the ST elevations in leads 1, V5, and V6, indicative of a larger inferior lateral STEMI. Inferior lateral STEMIs frequently also involve the posterior wall, which is already suggested by the horizontal ST depressions in V1 and V2. So here is V4 through V6 replaced by V7 through V9. The very prominent ST elevations seen here are con confirmation of posterior wall involvement. The final special situation to discuss is how to diagnose an acute STEMI in the presence of a pre-existing left bundle branch block. This is particularly challenging since left bundle branch blocks lead to widespread secondary ST and T changes. These changes are typically in the opposite direction as the QRS complex. 
This leads to ST elevations and leads with prominent QS complexes, such as V1 through V3, and occasionally 2, 3, and AVF. And that leads to ST depressions and T wave inversions in leads with broad R waves, such as 1, AVL, V5, and V6. STT changes in the same direction as a QRS complex in a left bundle branch block are highly suggestive of a primary repolarization abnormality, which usually means ischemia or infarction. Specific criteria using this principle has been developed to aid in the diagnosis of a STEMI in the presence of a left bundle. It's known as the Scarbosa criteria. Formally, there are three of them, but one provides almost no additional diagnostic benefit, so I advocate an abridged form with only two individual criteria. The first is ST elevation equal to or greater than one millimeter in a lead with a positive QRS complex. Here's a typical QRS complex ST segment and T wave in leads 1, AVL, V5, and V6 in a patient with a left bundle branch block. These are the changes due to just the block. And here's what those segments and waveforms might look like in those leads in a patient experiencing a STEMI. There's ST elevation of greater than one millimeter. The second Scarbosa criteria is ST depressions equal to or greater than one millimeter in V1, V2, or V3. Here's a typical appearance of the QRS, ST, and T in those leads from just a left bundle. And here is the morphology suggesting an acute MI. The Scarbosa criteria, including this abridged version, has a poor sensitivity of around 20 to 35 percent, but an excellent specificity of over 90. Here's an example of a patient with a pre existing left bundle who is now experiencing an acute MI. You can notice the concordant ST to elevations most prominently in leads 2 and V6, and the concordant ST depressions in V1 through V3. There are two additional signs of an MI in a patient with a left bundle. These are seen in subacute and chronic MIs. Cabrera sign is a prominent notching of the upstroke on the S wave in leads V3 or V4. And the Chapman sign is a prominent notching of the upstroke of the R wave in leads 1, AVL, V5, or V6. As with the Scarbosa criteria, these are specific but not sensitive. To end part two, I'll bring back this slide from part one that summarized the common injury patterns from MIs and the likely culprit vessels. And then let me revise it to reflect our new knowledge of posterior and RV infarcts. So that concludes this video on the EKG findings of myocardial infarctions. The next video in this series will discuss a systematic approach to the EKG which incorporates all of the information learned in the preceding videos.